chapters 10 and 11 were all about gases, um, both just their physical composition and then their molecular composition, talking about actual gas molecules. 12 is where we handle the other two phases of matter. How many phases of matter are there? Four. Four. So I say the other two because we really usually only handle three of them in chemistry. We're really poorly equipped to deal with plasmas. They are very high energy. I mean, you can observe them. You can look at them in the light tubes, um, but it's not something that we work with in the chem lab. So you already had some stuff on solids. We're really not going to do anything with solids here. Um, the solids unit that you did before the museum on crystalline solids and crystal structures, that is all you're going to get about solids. But what we do need to talk about is liquids. Um, because we can't talk about solutions unless we talk about liquids, and we can't talk about acids and bases unless we talk about solutions. And you really should know some things about solutions and about acids and bases. So we're going to give you some background on liquids. Um, you guys have a pretty good idea of what liquids are, and you've been dealing with them. And all of these points were hit in your what do you know. Definite volume, no definite shape. Um, you mentioned that they were lower energy. They're lower in kinetic energy. So they're moving more slowly than those in gases or plasmas. And because they're moving slowly enough, you can they can catch one another. You know, so this is like some crazy game of tag. And in gases, the particles, remember we said, were moving so fast that they didn't have time to slow down and be attracted to one another. And we had that image of somebody running through a party. And no matter how cute that person standing in the corner is, you don't have time to talk to them. You don't have time for forces of attraction to kick in because you're moving too fast. Um, water is a much slower, or liquids are a much slower party. So the particles are moving slowly enough that there's time for them to form attractions and bonds between them. And they have, you know, we've talked about some of these dipole-dipole forces, hydrogen forces, hydrogen bonding. Um, but there are definitely attractive forces between individual particles, molecules, or atoms. Okay. We call liquids fluids. We also call gases fluids. So there are two phases of matter that are covered by the term fluid. Anything that flows. If it's capable of flowing, if you can pour it, it's a fluid. Can you pour a gas? Yes, you can. Sure you can. Um, if you have ever... So this is a challenge to you. Go find a sloping yard or pasture that terminates in a low point like a creek. Go in the evening as the sun is dropping below the horizon. Go with bare ankles. Go stand on that slope. And what you will feel if you walk around, you'll find them, are rivers of gases. You will find air flowing down that slope. Yeah, you can most certainly pour a gas. We don't think of it, though. It's not something we ever think about. But yeah, they flow. And liquids flow. You're all familiar with pouring pitchers of whatever. You can pour a pitcher of Kool-Aid, water, lemonade, orange juice. Um, that's because the particles can still flow past one another. So in liquids, yes, there are, they're going slow enough that there are forces of attraction between them. But they're still free enough that they can move around one another pretty easily. They don't get very far, not like in a gas, but they, can, they don't have a fixed position. OK. Um, clearly, liquids are higher density than gases. So let's see if I did, did I make you do this when we were talking about gases? Take your hands up like this. Now, smack the air in front of you. I know, you feel silly, right? But it gets your blood moving. Does it hurt? No. OK. Now, how many of you have ever been in water? If you haven't been in water, you have homework. You need to find a pool or a pond or a tub or a creek or something. If you can imagine being in water up to, up to your shoulders or up to your chest and doing that same thing as hard as you can, does that hurt? Yes. Why? Why doesn't it hurt to smack air, but it hurts to smack water? It's more dense, and it's also less compressible. 
So not only are you hitting more particles when you bring your hands down on water, and if you've ever done a belly smack into a pool, you know how painful that can be. The water ahead of your hands, not only, you, you pretty well move through those molecules, those particles, but if you, for instance, do this, you can compress some molecules between your hands and others will move out of your way. With a liquid, they don't compress very easily. So they're more densely packed, they're harder to just move out of the way, and they don't compress very well. So all of that contributes to, they feel pretty tough when you smack them. Um, they diffuse. It wasn't recording. Um, put some bromothiamol blue in, it's not evenly distributed. There are streaks and then there are clear areas, but it will even out because liquids diffuse with one another. So if we put two liquids together, the random motion of their particles will continue until they are evenly mixed. It's called Brownian motion, and you can observe it if you, if you have um, siblings, cousins, nieces, nephews, if you yourself are easily entertained, get a big pitcher, put a couple drops of food coloring in it, and then just put your chin down on the table and watch it, and you can see that food coloring moving around. Why is it moving? Because the particles are moving. The movement of the food coloring actually shows you the movement of molecules. I find that mind-blowing. Um, liquids have surface tension. So some liquids have really high surface tension. Water is one of them. Um, you can float things on water pretty easily because there are very strong forces um, between the water molecules that create sort of a skin of force on the water. They pull those molecules closely together. If you've ever seen water striders, you've seen something that lives basically on surface tension. Um, and liquids to one degree or another have capillarity, which means that um, the surface of the liquid is attracted to solids. Paper towels absorb things because of capillary action. Because the liquid, whatever liquid it is, whether it's isopropyl alcohol or water or milk, the surface of that liquid is attracted to those small spaces inside the paper towel, and it wicks up into it. Water is exceptionally high in capillarity. Okay, we won't talk about phase changes with a diagram until Monday, but there are a couple terms that you should be familiar with. If we're talking about the liquid, liquid gas boundary, so going from a liquid to a gas, we call vaporization, and there is a difference between evaporation and boiling. The big difference. If I leave this container of water out, if I just leave it on the counter and go away for the summer and come back, will there be any water left in it? No. What will have happened? It evaporated. This is like a first grade science standard. You know, first graders doing science. You put water in a cup and you watch it and it gets a little bit lower every day and it goes away. Where did it go? Into the atmosphere. The key part with evaporation is that Water molecules that are escaping into the vapor phase are all doing it from the surface. So remember that those particles inside the water are all moving around. So these particles inside that water column are all moving around. And their motion is random. They're just flying in all directions. Every now and then one of them that's close to the surface ends up randomly sort of getting enough energy, getting a running head start, and it leaps free. I'm free, I'm free! Of the liquid phase, and it ends up in the vapor phase. And this is kind of like when you collected a gas over water that we said some of those liquid particles in the water are going to get dragged up into the gas phase. Here, they're just kind of doing it. It's sort of random. So evaporation is when they're escaping from at the surface. And this is something that is not boiling. <clears throat> boiling is different because what boiling means is that you're giving, let me get rid of this guy, you're giving the particles in, down in the water enough energy to escape. So the vaporization is because the particles down inside the liquid are, are getting enough energy to escape the surface. How do you know something's boiling? Who here has boiled water? Okay, if you have not boiled water, you have homework or you need to take foods and nutrition. Um, how do you know that something is boiling? 
bubbles. It bubbles. It's one of the first things little kids learn in the kitchen, I hope. Um, those bubbles start usually coming from near the bottom of the pan. Have you noticed that? Why is that? You, that's where the most energy is, and that energy from the metal pan is basically kicking those water molecules, those water molecules in the butt, and giving them enough energy to escape from being a liquid and escape to being a gas. At the moment when they get enough energy to be a gas, a bunch of them, they form little bubbles. And the bubbles start out small, because there are a few of them, and they get bigger and bigger, until you have a rolling boil, and it's bubbling. So the difference between boiling and evaporation. Now, you all know that if we go from a liquid to a solid, we call it freezing. We can also call it solidification. Okay, that's the other term for that is solidification. Okay, um, in solids, like I said, you're not going to get a whole lot about it. I'm really going to skip this. There are two kinds. They're packed closely. They have low energy. Moving on. Again, same stuff. You know most of this stuff. And uh, the one thing I will mention here is the diffusion of solids. So you know that a gas diffuses. Somebody brews, again, I can, I can use coffee. If somebody brews coffee in the house in the morning, does the smell, do the little particles of coffee odor make their way to your nose? Oh, yeah. It's worth getting out of bed. Um, that's diffusion of a gas. The little tiny molecules or vapors, those smell particles, end up in the air and diffuse. If you put cream in your coffee, I can use coffee for everything today. This is my goal, chemistry through coffee. Um, you put cream in your coffee, it diffuses. Even if you don't mix it up, eventually it will be evenly distributed. If you take two solids and you put them side by side, will they diffuse? We say no. In truth, yes but it's really, really minor. Um, it's literally a few atoms, like <laughs> thousands of years, um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. You can get, when you have two solids side by side, you can get a few atoms of each to change places with one another. Um, but it's crazy slow. It's so slow we usually just say it doesn't happen, but you should know that technically, theoretically, it does. This is, we're going to talk about equilibrium and the rest of our, equilibrium is important enough that we're going to spend a little bit of time on it. Equilibrium is a dynamic condition on which two opposing, in which, in which, not in, on which, in which two opposing changes occur at equal rates in a closed system. So we are going to demonstrate equilibrium because how many of you think that that definition doesn't make any sense to you whatsoever? It's kind of dense. Ha <laughs> ha Solids, liquids, never mind. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. I'm going to draw it and then we're going to do it. So if we've got a little flask here that's closed with a nice little stopper, and in that flask we have some water. It's a terrible stopper, but... If we have water molecules that are in the liquid phase, we said they're moving around randomly. And every now and then, one of them gets enough energy, woohoo! I'm free! To escape, to break the bonds of being a liquid. Um, it zips past all those other water molecules it might have been attracted by, and it escapes. But here's the other part of this. The very same time, up that, are there particles in the vapor phase up above that water? Yeah, of course there are. And we're kind of assuming that this is a vacuum. We sucked all the air out of this, so this is just water and water vapor. No nitrogen, no oxygen, no CO2. Well, these guys are moving around randomly, too. 
And every now and then, one of those guys gets close enough to the water's surface that it, in essence, gets caught. And it gets, it's like getting sucked into quicksand for a water molecule. It ends up hitting the water surface, and it becomes part of the liquid phase. And this is happening constantly on the surface of the liquid. Now, this, if we don't change the temperature or the pressure in this system, these are happening at equal rates. So it is equilibrium. Dynamic means changing. So the same water molecules are not always in the liquid phase or always in the vapor phase. They're changing places, but you know, the, the rates are equal. So for roughly everyone that goes from liquid to vapor, one goes from vapor to liquid. Easy to understand. Now what I would like you to do is all become water molecules. This is going to be challenging. I've never done this in a class where we had two people on crutches. Um, it's kind of a new thing. But we're going to make a little closed system. So I would invite you all to come over to the door. OK, so we just did our little thing where we were having molecules go from liquid phase to vapor phase and back and forth. When we were at equilibrium, we had equal numbers coming in going out. And we were maintaining our balance. The same number of particles were staying in vapor as were in um, liquid. Now, you know, I just realized I, I screwed this up with our, with our little model there. And that was a model. That was a, a physical model of a process. I had even numbers in liquid and vapor. Could we be at equilibrium and not have equal numbers? Yes, we could. The rate of change just has to be equal. So if we have in this closed system um, 25 particles in vapor phase and 75 in liquid phase, as that system changes, as they trade places back and forth, it just means we're going to stay around the same number of particles here. You know, we might have a moment where there are 26 and 74, and then we might have a moment where there are 24 and 76, and then we might be back to 75 and, you know, it's approximate. But the rates of change are the same. So we're basically keeping the same balance. You know, in our case, it was inside the classroom door and outside the classroom door. Um, we're maintaining approximate numbers on either side. And, and of course, we were doing this with 10 bodies. You know, here we're talking about billions and billions and billions and billions of particles. OK, now, this is what we just did, equilibrium related to phase change. So we can talk about equilibrium, like I said, in biological balance. We can talk about it in physics when forces are balanced. Here we're talking about it in, in chemistry. And it can be with reactions. And what we just did was equilibrium with phase changes. And what you saw happen was that in any liquid, some particles do escape. And in any gas that's above a liquid, some particles will get sucked into the quicksand of the liquid, get trapped. The way that we express this, it looks a lot like a chemical formula, doesn't it? or a chemical reaction. But it's not. I mean, it's one substance, and we aren't making any new substances. But what we're saying is if we take a liquid and we add some heat to it, what are we going to get? A uh, vapor. And if we take a vapor and we cool it, what do we get out of that? A liquid, and we get heat given off. OK? The thought that I'm going to leave you with in the one minute we have is what I'm going to call new normal. So I would imagine that all of you have been through some kind of change in your lives. You've changed schools. You've changed houses. You've had a sibling come into your family. You've had your dog die. You've gotten a new dog. You've changed jobs. Mom or dad has changed jobs. We'll talk about new normal on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy whatever it throws at you, be it cold and wet or sunny and moderate or frost. Anyway, have fun.